When teenager Joanne Horsfall went on holiday, she fell in love with Turkey. It was really like an idyllic lifestyle. And with a man. The whole atmosphere was quite romantic. I was pretty fearless in those days. I didn't really worry about anything happening. But something terrible did happen. I knew that I had to get away. The whole situation just became mad. I thought they're going to rape me or something. I was just terrified. Age 19, I started a new job. I was quite independent, but I didn't want to stay where I was. I didn't want to live and work in Welling Garden City. I don't think I knew what I wanted. I just knew that that wasn't it. I was looking to do anything that was a bit of fun to get me out of the rut that I was already in. Looking for interesting people or different people outside the, the circle that I lived in. Um, no offense to anybody who knew me then. When a friend of Joanne suggested a last-minute holiday in Turkey, she jumped at the chance. It was good, because it was the end of the month and I'd just got paid. I was really excited just simply by things like the climate. It was so hot and the landscape struck me instantly. You've got the sea, bright blue turquoise sea and um, high mountains. And it's a combination of like green and blue. All of that seemed to me to be quite exotic. I also didn't know what to expect in terms of, um, I don't know, anything really, you know, what, to, what we would be eating even. But I was up for everything. When you came into the driveway, immediately there's kind of a large opening. All of the workers and so on, were waiting at that entrance. Ladies, welcome. Turkey. I remember him just being quite sort of bohemian, a bit weathered, quite attractive and quite real. What about the bags? Hurry. My friend and I weren't particularly interested in doing all of the organised trips. And so Fetty did take us under his wing. It was nice because otherwise you just don't know really where to go. And I was just keen to see everything. Fetty told me that he would liked me the first time that he saw me coming off the bus. I was kind of bowled over by that. I liked the fact that he had his own life sorted out and he seemed to be his own person. The whole atmosphere was quite romantic, if you like. It was just, let's try the FS beer, let's have some rucky. fish on the boat, you know, this kind of thing. Towards the end of the holiday, Fetty just said to me, um, well, you know, you don't have to go back to your job. And so I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, you could just stay here with me. So I said, OK, then. 
And that's really it. <laughs> and then that's what I did. <laughs> My friend was unhappy that I'd formed a relationship with this man. We also just didn't want the same from life, so we did have a major falling out. I didn't want to upset my friend, but um, that is what happened. life quite quickly. Early days, it was me and Fetty basically doing quite a lot of trips together. I was bowled over by the hospitality of the people, so I didn't really see anything in terms of culture difference. She really had no cares or worries. I think she saw it as an idyllic existence and a bit of a paradise, um, and she loved it to start with. It never occurred to me that um, things would go quite so horribly wrong as they did. Joanne Horsfall had come to Turkey on a two-week holiday but stayed when she fell in love with hotel owner Fetty Alpazar. I'd been in Turkey about a year, probably, and we discussed the idea of having a baby. I was pleased about her being pregnant because I think she, she always wanted children. When Oliver was born, it was just quite chilled. The whole thing was a magical time for me. But um, it was an odd situation, us being unmarried and having a child in Turkey. You just did not have children out of wedlock. It did cause a little bit of embarrassment for Fetty's family. We decided that it would be silly not to get married. And we felt that we'd be, you know, a family unit. Yeah. I depended quite a lot on his family and I was very grateful for their support. I had tremendous respect for his father because he wasn't a showy kind of a man and he was just a very hard-working, genuine man. But um, if you're a Western woman and you've come and got married in Turkey, there's still an unwritten thing that you're kind of, I don't know, second-hand goods or, um, you know, a little bit trashy. Fetty didn't want people to have that view of me. Once she'd become the mother of his child, I, I think he saw her in a completely different way. In his view, I should not be acting like a tourist. No. I shouldn't be doing anything that tourists do. Like go and have a drink in a bar or, you know, just go down to the beach. I knew that he was taking tourist girls on trips. I did start to get resentful that he was having a good time. It was obvious that we had different plans. In 1989, the year after Oliver was born, Joanne's parents and sister Karen came to visit. I don't think Fetty realised how close Joanne and I were and I got the impression he was quite jealous of our relationship. And I couldn't understand why he would be jealous of his wife's sister. It, it made no sense to me. It was obvious to my family that, um, you know, things weren't right. One afternoon, we'd gone out shopping. I'd gone with my dad. Oliver was being looked after back at home by my mother and my sister. 
On the way back, my dad said, oh, let's have a beer in this bar. So we were just going to have one drink and um, go back. Dad. Betty came out looking for me. I was smoking a cigarette that my dad had given me. I wasn't allowed to smoke. All of a sudden, just out of the blue, Betty sort of rushed in and said, you know, what are you doing here, you fucking whore? I could not, for the life of me, understand why he got so angry about me doing anything independently. He dragged me off the bar stool. My dad was pretty dumbfounded. After that, I wasn't allowed to go out. After Joanne's family returned to England, Fetty became even more controlling. He didn't want me to draw attention to myself. That I was just kind of invisible, really. I was feeling very trapped. She became more and more unhappy with the situation. One late morning when Oliver was about three or so and I was upstairs and hadn't fixed breakfast, Betty came into the house and got very angry with me. He started shouting obscenities at me, you know, what kind of a mother are you? You know, you call yourself a mother, you couldn't do anything, you know, that kind of thing. and then closed the door on Oliver. He carried on shouting at me and um, hitting me. <coughs> and um, Oliver was screaming outside the door. <coughs> he then went away, I think, to get some help. And I think Fetty must have, you know, opened the door and effectively let me out of the room. I rushed into our kitchen and got hold of a massive knife and really screeching and wailing and, and um, swearing. incredible is that I still regarded it as relatively normal. I still didn't really see how abnormal it was, you know, for a family to be like this. One evening, Fetty came home and the big bone of contention was that I was looking sad that I wasn't welcoming him with a happy face. That drove him mad. You me. You're I'd be like, yes. what do you expect? I'm not happy. And he'd be like, I don't want a moping wife. And on this particular occasion, he hit me. I sort of managed to run out. Um, he ran after me, and then I tripped and fell, and then he was kicking me in the parking space at the front of the flat. I shouted for help, and there were lights in all of the windows, so I knew somebody must be up still. But um, nobody replied, nobody came out. I think that people just did not want to get involved in this particular, you know, domestic situation.
I then ran to my mother and father-in-law's house. And I stayed there the night in a quite a wounded state. They knew what their own son was like, and they knew that we had a lot of difficulties. I spoke to Fetty's dad in the morning just to say, I really want to go home, go back to England. And his answer to me was, I'll decide when you need to go home. First of all, I was completely dumbfounded, sort of just gobstruck that he would say that. And then really, really gutted because I knew that I had absolutely nobody. If I had have had the means just to run away at that point in time, I would have done. When she rang home, she decided that she wanted to come home. It was just a case of how she was going to get home. Joanne's problem was that she had no money and Fetty had hidden her passport. And I realised that I'd have to bide my time and just simply stay in England the next time I was there. Finally, in 1994, with Oliver now six, Fetty allowed Joanne and their son to go to England on holiday. They were to stay at Joanne's sister Karen's house. Fetty was to join them two weeks later. Fetty took us to see us off. Living with the deceit was awful. Oliver said goodbye and cuddled his dad and was really excited just to be sort of going on an aeroplane and going away. I said goodbye to Betty and then turned away quite quickly and just walked away without looking back. I was really, really sad about leaving my life behind, but my life as it was had become so, um, you know, impossible. When we got back to the UK, it was immediately stressful because I knew what I was about to do. I rang him up. I said, you don't need to come here at all. I'm not coming home. He said, do you know what you're doing? You must be mad. He felt it was her duty to stay there and look after his child and bring him up. The actual conversation was ridiculously short, really. I just said, you know, I'm not coming home. That's it. I haven't got anything more to say. We anticipated difficulties um, once she told Fetty that she wasn't planning on going back to Turkey. A week later, Fetty flew to Britain. Fetty turned up at my house. He just wouldn't accept that she didn't want to go back to him. Fetty was really angry because he was convinced that my family had made me act in this way. He seemed to think a lot of it was my fault that I had made her come to this decision. I want to see them now. It wasn't very pleasant, and we did feel quite threatened. I felt that this man was extremely dangerous to me. I was concerned about Oliver because I knew that his dad wouldn't just leave it there, that we weren't going to come to any kind of talking solution. He knew where all the family lived and he knew where she was staying, so um, she just went to a refuge so that he wouldn't know where she was. I was strongly advised by one of the ladies who ran the refuge to get some legal advice about my situation. I went to see a solicitor. I put in an application for a residence order for Oliver so that Oliver's dad wouldn't be allowed to remove him from the country without my permission. 
And we found ourselves in a legal battle, which ended up at the High Court. My sister travelled with me up to London for the hearing. I was given the impression that I could almost not lose. With her estranged husband looking on, Joanne described to the court why she fled Turkey with Oliver. But Joanne lost her application to keep Oliver in England. Because Oliver had been born in Turkey, the court ruled that she would have to seek custody in Turkey. I was flabbergasted. We didn't expect them to wash their hands of the whole thing. It just felt like a bad dream, really. I was so incredulous. My confidence in the entire system was completely shattered. She decided not to go and fight it because she felt she didn't have a hope in hell of winning. Um, simple as that. Because of the different culture, the different court system, because he was the, the breadwinner in the family. She just felt that Fetty would be awarded custody. By refusing to return to Turkey, Joanne would be giving up her rights over Oliver. Two days later, Fetty came to claim his son and take him back to Kemmer. And I'd sort of, like, kept it together. But the minute I saw him, I could hardly control my anger. But to, to add insult to injury, he'd bought breakfast in a little polystyrene box. I completely lost the plot and started screaming at him, saying, you know, I've all right, I've given him breakfast. Don't you think I even give him breakfast? Oliver was very sorry for me. This was the awful thing. He knew that I was sad and he, he was quite bright and cheerful. And he's sort of going, it's all right, Mum, I'll see you soon. And, um, and so they walked away. It's like my whole, you know, the bottom of my world had fallen through, do you know what I mean? I didn't realise that it wasn't over. Despite losing custody of her son Oliver, Joanne Horsfall decided to stay in Britain. Her estranged husband, Fetty Alpazar, meanwhile returned to Turkey with Oliver. I tried to get with the idea that Oliver, you know, was going home, so he was in a much better place, because um, this whole thing that I'd orchestrated had done him no favours. I felt that both his dad and I were responsible for, you know, causing this, um, you know, poor boy so much sort of just unnecessary kind of suffering. Joanne was obviously extremely upset. Lots of tears. I think she was um, carrying a hell of a lot round in her head. She was probably quite scarred by it, quite badly scarred by it. I just... Um, just carried on, you know, and paid bills and got a job and drank a lot of red wine. Although she'd lost Oliver, Joanne managed to start afresh. She moved to a new town, Nebworth, found herself a job and met a new man, Brian. We'd have the odd phone call that was kind of reasonably pleasant. He was absolutely convinced that if Oliver was going home with him, then obviously I would be. 
But he was fighting a losing battle and I wasn't really, you know, biting his bait. I always did laundry and cleared up the flat a bit on Friday evenings before I met up with my boyfriend. I'd got home and, and um, was pottering around and around maybe seven o'clock or so in the evening, um, there was a knock on, on, on the door. And I, I never really had visitors around, so, you know, it wasn't like I was expecting anybody. Then the door opened just a little bit. So I shouted down, you know, who is it? And um, there's no reply. After about, I don't know how long, but it's got to be a minute while I'm just sort of standing there frozen at the top of the stairs. I was just terrified. I had no idea of what was happening at all. One of them held me down with my face in the settee. <laughs> and the other one taped up my wrist. <laughs> I thought they're going to rape me or something. I felt like time had just suddenly stopped still. A few minutes later, my boyfriend opened the door with his key and came in. <laughs> Obviously, this wasn't what was expected. <laughs> and they put tape over my boyfriend's mouth and taped his hands and his feet. They then grabbed a big coat of mine and bundled me down the stairs and round the back. They had a camper van parked. I was put in the back of the van. I was just trying to handle this situation in any way I could. I could just see little, little tiny chunks of light and see the orange street lights go past. But I've never not moved so much in my life. We drove and we drove and I lost track of time. I'd say that I even probably dozed off a bit. The next thing I then knew was we were being checked at some kind of port. I did think about um, raising an alarm, but the guy says, don't you dare say anything because it will mean that you'll get hurt. Other people will get hurt. Um, I didn't say anything. We pulled off the road. Then they took me out of the car. <clears throat> Walked me over to a car, which, as I got close, realised had Petty standing outside of the car. So I started shrieking and yelling, saying, what on earth are you doing now? What do you think you'll get from this? Why are you doing this to me? I don't know what planet he's living on, 
and it's really not flattering or nice to be, you know, this wanted by anybody. That's what I thought. And he was just like, look, Joanne, you just need time to think. You will come round to, you know, to my way of thinking. You will. And I'm like, I won't. I realised with horror that Oliver was sat in the back seat. And I'm like, oh, my God. I thought it was pretty nasty, really, his dad bringing him with him. But it had the desired effect. I decided the thing would unfold as it unfolded and I wasn't going to cause any more commotion or upset for Oliver. Fetty paid off the kidnappers, then hit the road south with Joanne and Oliver. Back in England, despite being gagged and bound, Joanne's boyfriend eventually managed to raise the alarm. Two plainclothes police officers turned up at my house and were asking me questions about my sister when I'd last had contact with her, when I'd last seen her. Nobody had heard anything from her. We were obviously extremely worried, but I, I just had a gut feeling that it was something to do with Fetty. scenario that I thought was an actual possibility was that Fetty would kill us all. You know, if we can't all live together, we'll die together. He'd already made mention of those kind of things. Joanne's kidnappers, who turned out to be former paratroopers hired by Fetty, were arrested trying to re-enter the UK. They were stopped coming through Dover because by this time an all ports warning had gone out um, about the incident. They were in a VW camper van and there was something suspicious about it. They found whatever they should been bound with. I think Fetty paid these guys to kidnap her in sheer desperation because he could see no other way of getting her to go back to Turkey. An Interpol alert went out across Europe for Joanne and Fetty. My worry was that he would do something stupid and harm her because of his state of mind. I really had no idea what he had planned. I didn't know if I was going to see her again. I thought maybe I could um, just get out of petrol station, go to the loo and run out the back without really being noticed. <laughs> the problem was that Fetty was following me and watching me, whatever I did. And I didn't speak the language. And I just sort of thought, you know, there's completely no point in doing this. of the second day travelling, we approached the Turkish-Bulgarian border, which is only a small patrol border. Fetty started getting a bit twitchy. Mm. 
but I just thought, if I suddenly jump out of the car, it's more likely to, me, to look like me that's gone completely mad. He'll just be like, yeah, that's my wife, here's our passports. <laughs> As Petty went to show passports, he was ordered out of the car. The guards had been alerted by Interpol that there was a search on, you know, for me. Petty knew that he'd been caught and that he was a bit stuffed. The family was taken to the local police station, where Joanne called her sister Karen. I burst into tears just with relief. I, I, I just remember I was so relieved to hear from her. And I just remember thinking, oh my God, she's okay, thank God for that. You would expect if, if um, Interpol were looking for me that somehow I'd be considered to be the victim of a crime. We were all told that we'd have to stay there overnight and we'd have to answer charges in the morning. We would have to answer charges in the morning. And then they put us all in one little cell. And I actually said to Fetty, <clears throat> You know, why are we in here then? Why is me and Oliver in here? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know what they're up to. I don't know. When Joanne Horsfall and her kidnapper husband, Fetty Alpazar, were arrested at the Turkish border, she too was thrown in a police cell alongside Fetty and their son, Oliver. I found it completely freakish that we were all in the cell together. One of the um, police officers came down and, and said, um, we'll, we'll, we think we'll separate you. Would Oliver like to go with his dad? down in the male cells downstairs, or would Oliver like to stay with his mum in this cell upstairs? And um, Oliver's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to the boys' cells downstairs. The next morning, the family was taken to court. I didn't have any opportunity for representation or advice. With hindsight, I should have asked for it. And they started saying, well, you know, you, you are still married, aren't you? And is this boy your son? And they were like, well, you know, you don't really want to make a fuss in front of him. Really and truly, it's a domestic situation between yourselves. This is Turkish, Joanne. I didn't realise that it would be me having to um, actually be a complainant and press charges. Under Turkish law, if Joanne didn't press charges, there was no case for Fetty to answer. And again, she believed a Turkish court would favour her husband, not her. I don't believe any of them took a really serious view of the whole situation. I was quite intimidated. It was all quite creepy. I decided not to press any charges. And that literally, we were just shown out um, maybe a few minutes after that. Fetty was a free man, and he still had custody of Oliver, despite having kidnapped Joanne.
Fetty tried to persuade Joanne to return with him and Oliver to Kemmer. But within a week, Joanne was heading back to England, alone. I regretted leaving Oliver. I regretted leaving the family life that we could have had. But I knew I had to get away. And I didn't believe for a moment that his dad would really do anything bad to him. And I kissed Oliver and then I looked back and waved. It was a sad farewell, but, um, was a definite goodbye. Joanne's quite sad that she's missed her son growing up. On the other hand, I think, in a weird way, she was quite happy that he was at least happy in Turkey and he was with his dad's family. I don't think Fetty ever accepted that I had an independent will. I think he justified kidnapping me in his mind because he thought that was the right order of things. He thought the fact that I'd left, the fact that, you know, all of the stuff that had gone on, he thought that was all wrong. And he, he totally justified the, the fact that he kidnapped me. Today, Fetty still runs a tourist hotel in Kemmer. Oliver is a student at Istanbul University, and Joanne still lives in England. But now she and her son are in regular contact. I have never, ever got over what happened. And it's only now that my son is an adult that I can um, sort of feel a bit freer of it.